My name's Pete Woods. You're watching Hexham TV. Who are you? I'm Dr. Stan Beckinsale, and I've written a book which I brought with me today, which is here. And I'd like to talk about it today. So tell me, Stan, tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, well, my background is that I'm a trained teacher and I've taught at all kinds of different levels. I've been a head teacher of two schools, head of department and others. I've trained teachers and that's been my life, except that um, I've taken up archaeology as um, a kind of almost a subsidiary to my life and uh, done quite a lot of excavations and things like that. So I'm a teacher, but I'm also uh, an author of poetry and history, and I'm an archaeologist. Stan, death is quite an unusual thing to uh, write about. Yes. Why did you decide to write about rituals of death? Well, I've written so many books now, and I sat down and thought, now what am I going to write about now? What do I know that nobody else knows or very few people know? What experience have I got which is worth passing on to other people? And I thought, well, I've done five major excavations in West Sussex and in Northumberland. And they've all been concerned with prehistoric rock art and with burials. And uh, then I've done quite a lot of work on modern gravestones and on modern history. And so I thought, well, this is it. Rituals of death, because we're all going to die. So it's a common subject for all of us. And it's not a gruesome thing. It's, uh, you know, it tells you what society thinks about people um, and especially what they commemorate when they die. And so that's really what the book is about. Very appropriate at the moment with uh, so many diseases around and so many people dying. And I think this is the moment to write such a book. And I suspect that there's not too too much already written on the subject, Stan. You're sort of um, using your knowledge. Oh, yes. Um, you, nobody could have written this book except me. No. I mean, I've used other people's work, obviously. One does this. But if I haven't got something of my own to contribute, it's not worth writing. So we've got to bear in mind that those two things are together. The general picture, which I've absorbed from other people, and my own contribution to this subject. Yeah. So I think you've got some slides that you want to show us, is that right? Yes, I've got some pictures because um, the book is very, very much based upon photographs. And I think that's important to realise. It's not just words, it's, um, it's images. because uh, that's got a lot to do with ritual. Ritual isn't necessarily um, just speaking. It's also what you can see. So we can start with that then, with prehistoric, and then go on to modern ritual. Now, the first picture is of a very important excavation that's going on in Orkney. Now, at the centre of that is a very large complex of started to excavate them about 10 years ago. It's captured the public imagination because the whole of that ness, that long stretch of land on Orkney, uh, links together standing stones, stone circles, uh, and... Uh, all sorts of burial sites and it's a kind of progression you start at the left hand side there you walk down this kind of peninsula 
and you go from one sacred site to another. And this was what happened in prehistoric times, that when farming was first introduced in the Neolithic, as we call it, the New Stone Age, um, they laid claim to the land uh, because they felt that, you know, instead of being hunter-gatherers, they wanted to settle in one particular place and then they wanted to stamp their authority on that place. And one way of doing this was that they could lay claim through their ancestors to it. So they began to build these big monuments. And they're interesting because they weren't done by just a small local community. People must have come in from great distances to take part in this monumental building. So we'll have a look at one of them them now. Uh, that's Orkney. The next one is going to be um, a very familiar one. And this one is Stonehenge. Now, there's been all sorts of work on this. So I can't claim any excavations or anything on Stonehenge. But it's now acknowledged that Stonehenge is a place where you took the dead and you go down to the river and you come up to a place called Durrington Walls. And Durrington Walls is another huge henge and people used to gather there for ceremonies and to have feasts, to hunt pigs in particular. And Durrington was a place, if you like, where they celebrated life and fertility. Stonehenge was a place where you celebrated the dead. And the interesting thing about Stonehenge now is that we've found out all sorts of new things about it, like how there was a huge stone circle in Wales and they brought all the monoliths from there and erected them at Stonehenge. So, you know, what it means is this business of revering the dead and laying a claim to the land through their ancestors was a terribly important part of life. So we'll look at something else now, because they're not all that big. This is in Northumberland, and this is what is called a kist. And this is one way of burying the dead, where you put a contracted skeleton inside a stone-lined chest, which is the kist. And then you put a slab on the top of it. And this is just one of many kist. And um, into that kist, not only did they put either the inhumation or the cremation, but they put what are called grave goods. And that is things which they used and valued in their lives. And there's some examples in the next one, in the next photograph, which show us what Canon Greenwell in the 19th century discovered at Blauiri in Northumberland uh, in one of the kists. And there's a food vessel on the left. It didn't contain food, by the way, but it's a, it's a name that was given to it in the past, and we've kept it. Next to that is a jet and shale necklace, and then there's a little flint knife, and all those were buried. Uh, now, there was no skeleton because the, the point is that certain soils are very acidic, and if you put a body in, uh, it dissolves into practice, just the stain in, in the kist itself. So you don't expect to find skeletons everywhere. They, they very often don't exist because of this acidic soil. And the next one, the next picture, we, we have now changed from the prehistoric and we're looking at quite a different sort of way of honoring the dead. Now, this is in an old Buick churchyard, which is not very far away from that kiss that we've seen from prehistory. And there was a lot of training of pilots in the First World War. 
uh, at Melfield, and one of them died, and there he is. But the, the funny thing about that is the inscription where this young pilot is gone to join God's squadrons in the sky. We would write today, I think, but um, it says everything at that time. So this is a commemoration. This is a ritual, the ritual of putting a monument over somebody's grave, which commemorates what he's done. And the next one uh, is um, one in Elsdon. And this one is uh, a series of long bones flanking all sorts of other things like the skull and you get the crossbones. Children think they're looking at the grave of a, a pirate. <laughs> and uh, But it's a very common image in the 18th and 19th century to have a skull, to have long bones. But you've also got various other symbols involved in this ritual. And one is um, an hourglass. And there's an open book which shows what your life has been and what you're going to be accountable for. But there's also a coiled serpent. It's swallowing its own tail, so it's in a complete circle, and that's a symbol of eternity. So on these gravestones, you've got these common uh, symbols um, involved in this ritual of death. So we'll look at some more of these. Now, this is a very, very interesting one in full stone because on the right, you've got a young woman, you can see her narrow way, and she's holding flowers in her hand. But by her side is a little skeleton, and the skeleton's got its um, stomach ripped out, which the, they did when they were de depicting death, uh, you look at them carefully and you find that the stomach's been opened. And uh, he's got his hand on what looks like an urn of some sort on a table. She's gay, he's death. And that tells us, you know, what it's all about. No matter how young and lively you are, you're going to die. And that's all part of the ritual. Yes, the next one. Uh, this is probably a grave digger. It's in the same graveyard at Fallstone, and it's very, very uh, heavily done. You know, you've got a spade, you've got crossbones, you've got the, the skull at the bottom, and you've got the book on, on the right. And above it all is another skeleton, the head, the skull and light wings coming from it. That's probably a grave digger. So there we are. Now, this is incredible. This is at Felton. It's a place where I used to live. And I used to see this every Sunday <laughs> in the graveyard. And it's um, a depiction of Christ in majesty uh, in the middle. And on the left is the recording angel who writes down everything that you've done in your life that you're going to be accountable for. But on the right is this. It's quite considerable. And the next one, this is in church, a church at Ford. And on the floor, it's probably been somewhere else and it's been relayed. These things happen very often. Gravestones get incorporated into all kinds of buildings. And this is a piper. And it's a, one of the earliest Northumberland pipers. So 
it's a very unusual one to have that. And the next, please. This is even more interesting in a way because it's a whole uh, mill, a fulling mill, because cloth making was very important in in uh, Britain. And uh, here you get the actual picture of the mill and all the processes. And just across the road from the churchyard is the mill itself, hidden by trees now. Uh, but that's very interesting, a picture on the gravestone. Next, please. And this one is... Um, Uh, in Whittingham, and it's uh, a picture of um, a gravestone with a skull at the top, and underneath it, sorry, a crown at the top, and then underneath it, you've got um, a tool, which is a tanner's tool. It's for cutting the uh, leather into strips, and so that is a tanner's grave. So people are now... Um, putting a label to the occupation of the person who's buried there. And this is quite frequent now. It's interesting to pursue this in Northumberland. Uh, and you'll see a few more of these in my book. Yes, next please. This is a gardener at Stamfordham, a nice little basket full of goodies. And it looks as of the grave cover place and put against the church wall. Again, this is not unusual because some um, people needed to cut the grass in the grave, in the graveyard, and very often these gravestones are getting in the way. So rather than go round them, they take them out and put them somewhere else. Yes, and the next one. <clears throat> now, the starting place for the ceremony of burial started at the, the lich gate, traditionally. Lich means a corpse, a dead body, and that's where it would rest until the service began, or the service began from there. This one is at Warden. And the next one, um, this is quite to different uh, see at um, uh, Chillingham there's a, an amazing alabaster uh, uh, group of husband and wife um, Earl Grey of Chillingham and his wife and they're resting on a, a very large tomb which is made of sandstone and it depicts all the saints of Northumberland around it. But you can see his helmet is there. The souls have been taken up to heaven in a kind of hammock almost. And uh, that is for very rich people. It's very, very highly decorated, this. And it's always puzzled me because it's a very small church, but it is connected with Chillingham Castle, which accounts for the Earl Grey there. And the point is that this was probably intended for some other church, a bigger, more important church, but for some reason or other, it was decided to keep it there. So there we've got quite an interesting story uh, about <coughs> particularly grave. Yes, next, please. <coughs> now, this is one of the most important of all the ritual depictions, there is something called the Dance of Death or Dance Macabre. It was all across Europe. These are not just British things. And the idea was that we all must die and death comes to us in the form of a skeleton and it takes everybody in, into a kind of dance by the hand and starting with a baby and ending with the Pope himself. And it depicts all the different levels of humanity. And Hexham has actually got one 
uh, or a group of them painted on wood. How they survived the Reformation, I have no idea. But they're now being cleaned, they're being restored, and because they are of national importance. And this one you see is the emperor. You can see his sword, you can see his orb, orb and all the accoutrements, his uh, clothes, rich clothes, befitting an emperor. And there is death with his scythe, grinning at him, uh, looking at him. He's going to take him with him. Next, please. And sometimes uh, another part of the ritual is that you reuse some of the gravestones in uh, an, an ecclesiastical place like a church. And this is a new begin at the west end, at the east end, sorry. It's outside, and you can obviously see medieval gravestones which have been built to repair the end of that church. <clears throat> Next, please. And this one is a, a, a more elaborate gravestone that we see. There you've got the classical uh, urn, because the urn was what the Romans used to bury their uh, people in, the cremations in. And it's got an urn, it's got a curtain. I suppose it means the end of the drama, you know, the curtain coming down on you. You've got the book on the right. And uh, it's, it's an incredibly uh, ornate one. Yes, and the next, please. Uh, this is much simpler. This is a gardener's grave. Another gardener with a pair of shears there. And uh, this is typical of what you find in the ritual of death. Yes. And the simplest kind is this grave of Thomas Robson. And uh, it's 1625. So you can see it's quite an old one. And it's um, very often these things were done by local masons who were not, Ill were not literate. And they very often must have been handed something to copy and they didn't fully understand what they were doing. And very often you get um, mistakes made. Sometimes they miss words out and they have have to insert it. It's, they're not perfect by any means, but they're real and they're all part of this process of commemorating the dead. No matter un, how unskilled the mason may be, it was important to get the details of that person's life on that gravestone. Thank you. Now, this is unique. And it's only just come, well, it hasn't just come to life, but we've only just sort of made it available to the public. There's a tombstone in, uh, uh, in Hexham Abbey, which is 13th century. Uh, and we don't know who it's to. We know it had bones <clears throat> in the tomb. And it's, a, it's got a top, which is over 10 feet long, and at one end are two faces. And I think these are Adam and Eve. And from their mouths will grow this great vine. And the vine turns into a cross, which I think may well represent the, um, the final fate of Adam and Eve. They become something else. They become converted into something else. And this is a, a very, very interesting statement because the green man is another example where life comes out of his mouth when he dies and the uh, leaves grow all around his head. So in the end, only his eyes are vis visible in this sort of forest. And this one is different from that because it's not an oak tree or any other decision tree. This is vines. And you've got bunches of grapes um, in the, 
in the design as well, and vine leaves all the way around this um, uh, slab. It's it's an amazing thing. We've only just recently cleaned it up, and we've brought in special lighting to take this picture, and I'm very glad it came out like this. I took it with an ordinary camera. It's, it's not a great sort of... Uh, uh, thing, you know, it was just an ordinary cannon, and there it is. But do look at that, and that is the tomb itself. And on this, I'm going to end this survey of the graves in Northumberland. I mean, there are many more than this, but this is the kind of thing that uh, commemorates the dead. But this would be to commemorate somebody of some importance. And uh, the slab I've been talking about, the face is on, is obviously at the bottom there. So there we have it. Rituals of death. Um, very complex subject, but quite easy to understand, really. So that's really what the book's about, except that they're not in colour, the photographs, because it was too expensive. And they've managed to produce the book for £20, which is incredible. And uh, that is because it's in monochrome instead of colour. But I'm not doing any more books because I've already got one I haven't uh, had published yet. And that's um, for children, stories for children in verse. Completely different subject. But this one has been very interesting for me. I found it, you know, at my age too, <laughs> it's, it's been great. And uh, the amount of work that goes into it, uh, the amount of research you have to do into other people's work is, is quite phenomenal. But it's been worth it, every bit of it. Show us the uh, book again, Stan. The book. Now, this has got the design of Rituals of Death. And uh, it's got some of the graves on the back of it there. But originally, the cover I wanted for this was done by my granddaughter. And instead of that, instead of being on the cover, it's been used as a spacing page. There we are. In many ways, I pre prefer this. Um, because it's very simple, very effective, and she's very good at this kind of thing, and she's done most of my books recently, uh, Helen, and uh, that's it. But the book itself is just very well put together by the printer. And, uh, and that's, that's Pen and Sword, isn't it, Stan? Pardon? The, it's published by Pen and Sword. Yeah. Yes, it's published by Pen and Sword, and uh, they haven't produced many history books, but I'm pleased to say I'm one of them. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it's a firm in Barnsley, and uh, they published it for twenty pounds. You can probably get it from uh, Cogito in uh, Hexham if you live here, and it should be in major bookshops. But it's only just come out, so I don't know what the marketing is going to be like. But anyway, I'm not interested in the commercial side. I mean, the important thing is the book's there. The work's been done. And uh, there's quite a lot more that I haven't told you on this programme that's in the book. Dr. Stan Beckinsale, thank you very much for talking to Hexham team. That's a great pleasure. All up. Thank you.